today it's it's kind of a celebration so this is the part of the ms big book series which is celebrating ms 20th anniversary and it was to display variety of contributions from the social entrepreneurship community in europe and beyond so we have we already had some several presentations of different books related to social enterprise in Latin America, social enterprise in Asia, regarding the theory of social enterprise and pluralism in the global south. This is the fourth uh, book presentation in which we focus on the book social enterprise in the central and the eastern Europe. Uh, so far, and this book presentation is also show it developed empirical but also theoretical contributions towards development and understanding of social enterprises and social entrepreneurship sector. Just as an introduction, I will share two or three introductionary slides, and then uh, we will begin with the other authors' presentations. So I hope that you all can see the presentation. So as I said, today we are presenting Social Enterprise in Central, Central Europe, uh, Central and Eastern Europe book. I'm Daniel Baturina from University of Zagreb. I will have a privilege to host this celebration and to guide you through the book presentation. I'm also an author of co-author of two chapters in, in this book. To, together with me, uh, I will introduce them later. We have three other participants from three different countries that contributed, four different, uh, four participants from three countries that contributed in this book, Poland, Serbia, and Russia. And we have Martin Nissens from uh, Belgium, which, which is, which contributed also in uh, this book, but also led, co-led this XM project in which book uh, book was developed. So just very briefly about the book. So book is one of the children of the XM project. And this project lasted for, for seven years from 2013 to, 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 to 2020. Uh, idea about this book, as, a, as I remember, and I, I really cherish that, that uh, uh, that moment was also kind of articulated in 2016. So we had a seminar in Tirana about the Central and Eastern European part of the XM projects. And many of authors that, uh, that were the book chapter authors uh, in this book presented their national situations there. We brainstormed a bit about some transversion analysis as part of the XM project. Uh, also, we need to mention the co-structure and power SE, so empowering the next generation of social entrepreneurship scholars. Through Empower SE, uh, SE as well as the XM, a uh, lot of countries and a lot of researchers were represented. And to my delight, I noticed a lot of researchers from this region that were interested in, in topic and that were keen to collaborate, collaborate together on not only on this book but but also on the wider researchers regarding social entrepreneurship in this in this area the book itself has, has two uh, two major parts the first is national overview of social, social enterprise and after the introduction from the book uh, editors we have 11 national overviews so 11 chapters each one focusing on one specific issue and from the variety of countries presented here on, on this slide and variety of authors, you may notice that we are very well geographically covered, that a lot of authors contributed to this, this analysis, to my count, more than 30, 30 authors, and that we have also a contribution from younger scholars, from senior scholars. So it was also kind of empowering in collaboration. The second, the second part was comparative analysis and perspectives. So in this part, we had several, may, four, uh, to, to be more precise, uh, comparative analysis. 
And we have a concluding chapter from, uh, from Jacques Mart and, and Oliver Brolis uh, regarding testing the relevance of social enterprises models developed in, and, uh, and elaborated in Nixon project, but here testing of the relevance of those models in Central and East, Eastern Europe. Today, we will have three, three distinctive contributions. So we will talk about three specific uh, Central and Eastern European countries. We will talk about Poland, Serbia, and Russia, but also throughout these presentations, we will give insight in different notions relevant to the, for the development of the sector. For example, like historical and institutional legacies or exogenous, or exogenous factors of, uh, or drivers for development of social enterprise sector. After the third presentation, uh, Martin Essens, which, which were uh, XM Scientific Co-Director will comment on the presentation and general relevance of the book. And in the end, in the last 15, 20 uh, minutes, we will have opportunity for questions and general discussion. So you will be able to ask authors questions or to comment from your perspective about development of this sector in Central uh, and East, Eastern Europe. Also, you will be able to put uh, put your comments and uh, questions in chat. So we will monitor chat closely and articulate your comments during the discussion. So this is this is what is ex what is happening in next hour or so. So let's start. As you can see, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me for this presentation, and I am really glad to see uh, some old team members and some new members on the network. It's really a pleasure to discuss these topic, topics again. Uh, as you can see, the paper that I will present is a part of the uh, comparative uh, section of the book. So actually the three of us who were authors, and it's me and Konstantina Zerer from uh, Vienna, Austria, who is uh, originally Greek and who contributed with the uh, Greek experiences and Vardan Urutian, who is from Armenia. He is currently, I think, the, the rector of the Agricultural University in Yerevan. Uh, uh, discussing while meeting uh, during the COST uh, project, uh, we concluded that it might be interesting to compare experiences from the three countries. Uh, actually, it was me who was participating in earlier projects and uh, uh, I already traveled to Armenia uh, many years ago uh, but at that time I, I met also Rossi Nogales and uh, Julia Galera they were at the same project and that was opportunity to actually learn about experiences of other countries with uh, social enterprises uh, we didn't use much the concept of social economy at that time it was not a I think even in Europe, not so widely used. For us in Serbia, in Armenia, the, the social enterprise concept was very new and we wanted to dive into this field and learn as much as possible. So the deeper we went, the, the more questions opened and it was clear that uh, there is a lot to learn about what actually social enterprises are. And uh, specifically to make uh, uh, conceptual clarifications in order not to mix with other concepts. So I continued my academic career later on uh, uh, working on these issues. I also published a book on social economy later on, mostly trying to give answers to, to my own questions, but uh, I needed more uh, general approach and uh, I needed a kind of meta position in order to actually comprehend all the uh, peculiarities of different concepts and different uh, forms in which social economy actors can appear. So in that regard, uh, opportunity to uh, conduct a comparative analysis between the three countries who seemingly had a lot in common, historically speaking, and still were different in, in some other issues, I found as a great opportunity. So 
at that point actually we thought that uh, uh, distinguishing between uh, the influence of uh, endogenous and exogenous factors on the development of the social enterprise sectors in the three countries uh, was worth uh, conducting doing a research so that's uh, what we actually did at the end so idea was the the, the main uh, research question for us was uh what were what were the main factors uh, uh, first of all uh, how different are the sectors uh, in the three countries at the moment how much are they developed and the second question uh, was what were the major factors that contributing to tentative differences in order to do this we realized that we will mostly do a historical analysis with some uh, desk analysis of the uh, let's say uh, most general data about the sectors at the moment uh, uh, so we needed to uh, give explanation on how uh, social enterprise sectors were developed meanwhile so i'm already using some of the concepts that need some clarification uh, when uh, talking about social enterprise sector, we actually agreed that uh, the the social enterprise, social entrepreneurship initiatives in three countries, or at least in two countries, are so developed that there are different forms of social enterprises existing, and that they form specific sector of the economy, uh, having in mind uh, the the ways in which they are financed, how they make their incomes and uh, of course especially how they spent their uh, uh, money gained uh, the next thing was that uh, we distinguished between two main streams of influence on development of the sector and this is as we called endogenous and exogenous factors meaning we wondered how much there is authentic uh, experience and heritage in each of the countries to develop their own forms of social enterprises and how much uh, uh, projects, cooperations, uh, even investments from uh, foreign countries, first of all, European Union in these three countries, uh, is affecting the development of social enterprises in the three countries. So uh, these were our uh, concepts and uh, questions. Uh, now, or what were the similarities between the three countries maybe some of the greek colleagues or especially historians would not agree but we concluded that uh uh i mean uh, especially because the 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 concept of democracy was born in ancient greece but we agree that actually the three countries entered the modernization path more or less at the same point in time which means after the liberation of the Turkish occupation. So there was an Ottoman rule in all three countries uh, for a long period of time, and all three countries actually deliberated uh, in the beginning or uh, at the middle of the 19th century, and they started developing modern countries. So more or less these countries were not... Uh, were affected with the uh, with the uh, uh, national revolutions of the mid 19th century in Europe only at the let's say uh, value level and uh, uh, let's say uh, in more romantic terms but the institutions were very weak and uh, the, the let's say social fabric to work with was completely different than in most of the Central or Western European countries that passed this revolution. So these countries actually had to build from the beginning in, let's say, more Western style uh, societies. So uh, also the, the, the forms of the uh, sociability and the uh, social organization were different at that time. There was a strong influence of uh, traditionalistic culture, the, the strong influence of religion at that time, because religion was closely tied to the uh, national idea of that time and similar. Uh, but 
there were also some differences that were uh, actually uh, especially expressed after the Second World War. And this is that the three countries went uh, uh, quite different ways. Uh, Armenia, that was part of the uh, uh, Soviet Union, that went in, in this uh, typical uh, totalitarian socialist uh, uh, regime, let's say. Uh, Serbia is a part of uh, Yugoslavia that was uh, more Western-oriented and, and had a significant liberties, both in the cultural sphere and uh, in the economy. And Greece, that was after the period of the uh, military uh, dictatorship organized as the uh, Western democracy and uh, uh, market economy. So obviously there were three different uh, paths. Uh, so to cut the story short, what we concluded at the end was that uh, there was a specific uh, mixture of exo uh, exogenous and endogenous uh, uh, factors. But the major conclusion is that exogenous factors that are present in every country, especially in, in uh, uh, countries that joined European Union later on or still didn't join European Union, uh, are of higher importance. Uh, and uh, the sector is in, uh, in let's say, early development stage, not to the same level in all three countries. I can tell something about that. But what is important is that those exogenous factors, uh, knowledge transfer, money, uh, experiences, skills, uh, can be utilized only if there is a certain level of uh, endogenously developed sector in the country. So countries have to reach certain level of institutionalization, uh, networking, uh, skills acquiring in social enterprise sector in order to utilize uh, a share of knowledge and money uh, from more developed countries. And this is not going to the same level in all three of the countries. Uh, what, is, what was obvious was that uh, Greece has uh, a much stronger networking between the uh, social enterprises, uh, uh, different forms of uh, social enterprises, even at the regional level. Uh, in Serbia, there are some networks. They are very active and very important players because uh, the state was not playing a significant role. Some things change in meanwhile, and now we have the law, and even the, the program for support to social enterprises is being developed at the moment. And in Armenia, it is very underdeveloped. So in order to explain this, we also uh, uh, adopted, uh, adopted a, a classification that uh, distinguishes between initial stage of development, uh, stage of institutionalization, and the sustainability stage of development of social enterprise sectors. And we concluded that Armenia is in the initial stage. Serbia is, uh, was at the beginning of the institutionalization stage and Greece uh, was very far to the end of the institutionalization, probably moving to the develop, uh, uh, sustainability stage, thanks to these different uh, factors. One of the things that I maybe is not uh, written in the paper clearly, but I would like to stress here is that uh, uh, the uh, charity heritage of the Greek Orthodox Church that was not disrupted during the uh, after the Second World War was a, an important factor that uh, maintained not only the practice of helping in the community, but also the values of uh, 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 let's say, communal uh, support, uh, societal support uh, in the neighborhoods and so on. The thing that was uh, uh, interrupted in, in the other two countries. Uh, so this is also putting stress on how much the cultural framework is important for uh, development and sustainability of social enterprises. So I, I can't go through all the details and moments in 10 minutes, but these are just the basics that uh, show why at the end of this comparative analysis uh, proved to be fruitful.
Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Svobodan, for being short and highlighting some of the most important drivers that you find in your comparative analysis. Uh, we will now return to Anna, and hopefully, I uh, I hope that we we could hear her better. I will just stop sharing, so Anna, you can. Uh, what about this. now? Is it better? Yeah, yeah it's great now. Yeah. Great, great. So we we started a little bit later due to technical difficulties. So please try to be short, like seven eight minutes to right uh, to leave some space for the discussion later. Thank you. Right. Uh, so um, considering uh, the four countries uh, I mentioned before, so Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, and Croatia, we can see uh, four features that are specific for social enterprises uh, in these countries. And the first one is long standing uh, tradition uh, of two types uh, of uh, entities, two legal types uh, non profits, uh, so foundations, associations, and similar social organizations and cooperatives. The first uh, type um, uh, are even rooted uh, in the Middle Ages and uh, they were established in order to meet. Uh, social needs. We also have here the tradition of uh, charity and philanthropy fostered by the Catholic Church, which is especially, uh, which was and still is uh, important in the countries such as uh, Poland and Croatia. We also have here the traditions of different types of uh, programs implemented by municipalities like in Poland and the Czech Republic, uh, the tradition of mutuals and guilds in Hungary, Croatia, and the traditions uh, of establishing uh, foundations and associations, mostly foundations uh, by the rich individuals, which was uh, vivid in Poland, Croatia, and Hungary. And we have here the tradition of second uh, legal types, uh, so cooperatives, uh, entities uh, linked to the industrialization process in the second half of the 19th century, which at uh, the period, uh, the time which is also known as golden years of the whole cooperative movement in the four countries uh, studied. The second feature uh, is uh, sharing the common institutional path of these four countries after the Second World War, which we all know is uh, linked to uh, uh, socialism and uh, communist uh, um, uh, period. And uh, foundations and associations uh, experienced uh, uh, some separate um, uh, instruments, um, especially this was true for uh, foundations, which were abolished in Croatia, but also uh, in uh, Poland and in Hungary. The other instrument used by uh, the communist authorities is uh, creating mass organizations. So uh, it was uh, done by the amalgamation of uh, uh, previously independent associations, but mass organizations were fully controlled uh, by uh, um, the authorities. Uh, also, uh, the non-profits in uh, uh, the communist period uh, experienced very strong dependency on political situation uh, in uh, uh, all uh, four countries. Uh, the second, the third uh, feature uh, characteristic for these four uh, countries is what happened in the transition period with its uh, appreciation to neoliberal approach. We also witnessed uh, a sharp increase in numbers uh, regarding non -profit, um, profits, but uh, at the same time, uh, time uh, a sharp decrease in numbers regarding cooperatives, which were regarded as relics of the communist regime, also deprived of their social character and forced to compete with uh, business uh, enterprises. Also, uh, in the late 90s and early uh, 2000, 2010, uh, we witnessed uh, first trials of uh, institutionalization process of nonprofits. Um, for example, uh, it was done by uh, introducing some legal frameworks regulating mutual uh, relations between 
uh, foundations and associations and uh, public authorities, uh, and also the introduction of uh, some work integration, social integration as well, uh, organizations mostly within the term of uh, work integration social enterprise, visa visa. Uh, but this term is uh, formally recognized only in the Czech Republic, but not in uh, any uh, uh, other free uh, countries. And the last, uh, the fourth um, feature is uh, linked to EU integration narration. So all uh, of the countries studied are members of the uh, EU. Uh, and uh, since the entrance to uh, enter to the uh, European Union, uh, they formally uh, introduced some uh, legal frameworks specified only for some of uh, the social cooperatives. I mean social uh, social cooperatives, social enterprises, social cooperatives, which are recognized as uh, social, uh, enterprises uh, per se, uh, and the uh, process of integration to the European Union is also uh, linked to the evolution of non-profits uh, just uh, um, uh, in the direction of entrepreneurial non-profit, uh, making some money, collecting some money from the market, and the second, uh, the high inflow of the EU funds, you can also get some information about it uh, in the book, uh, in the chapter uh, authored, co-authored by uh, Daniel. As uh, for the legal frameworks for social cooperatives in these four countries, we can see that um, social enterprise is here a label. So a social enterprise uh, operates under different legal forms and are regulated by legal frameworks specific for these legal forms. So specific for associations, specific for uh, uh, foundations, specific for, uh, for social uh, cooperatives. Social enterprise is still a status, a label uh, for uh, this uh, uh, different legal types. We also have, as I said, uh, specific legal frameworks for uh, social cooperatives uh, in Poland, in Hungary in, uh, since 2006, in Croatia since 2011, and uh, since 2014 uh, in the Czech Republic. Um, um, Poland also recognized, uh, um, similarly to other uh, countries studied, uh, social enterprise within a wider concept of uh, the social economy. And uh, last change in Poland, last legal framework uh, was accepted uh, in July 2022. It was act on social economy with a special particular section, section two, um, social enterprise. Uh, so the whole regulations regarding social enterprise are for the first time in the legal act um, in that one uh, place. Uh, as for social enterprises and uh, public welfare systems in the four countries started, we can see that they are still supplementary entities. So uh, they fill in the gaps uh, um, which uh, um, are created by uh, market failure and government failure, but they are not uh, regarded as uh, partners equal to public uh, administration. Okay. And just uh, just one uh, one sentence. Um, I would like to in to invite you for uh, the presentation about C countries, Poland, Romania. We will have to. Uh, presentations uh, um, uh, about Romania and also Western Balkans and Eastern neighborhood countries, Slovakia and Croatia uh, during the MS uh, conference in Frankfurt, of course, if accepted by uh, the reviewers and uh, uh, the organizing uh, uh, committee. So that, that's all uh, from, from me. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for elaborating some of the historical nuances and current developments 
in the sector in these four stated countries. Of course, this is the MS Book Series event, but this is also an invitation, as you can see now in chat, to apply for uh, and participate in, in MS Conference, but also to join us in further exploration of these topics in this uh, panel session that uh, Anna just, uh, just mentioned. So we will go to the third uh, contribution and uh, Yuri, Yuri and Yulia, you, you can, if you have presentation, you can share and you can give us your insight in the social enterprises development in Russia. Yes, uh, Daniel, uh, thank you. Uh, we are going not to use uh, PowerPoint presentation for our 10 minutes, uh, taking into consideration that we have five minutes plus five minutes, uh, it'll be probably the best way. Well, uh, in any case, uh, thank you very much for inviting us for this very interesting event because uh, more than two years ago, already this uh, very interesting book was published. And now for us, maybe the most important and the most interesting point, uh, try to understand uh, what were the most important ideas and the most important results of our chapter because now the time is going very fast and uh, we are getting uh, huge changes literally every day. And now we can say that uh, at least three or four points up to now, not only still alive, uh, but still very important when and if we are thinking about social entrepreneurship in Russia. Uh, first of all, uh, in our chapter, uh, we not only try to analyze the historical premises of social entrepreneurship, uh, we try to emphasize from the very beginning what were and what are up to now the most important drivers of the whole movement. And uh, our idea from the beginning was very simple, that due to different reasons, in a Russian Federation, uh, two most important drivers for social entrepreneurship are uh, government uh, and uh, big businesses or Russian corporations. Uh, I'm not talking, we are not talking that uh, there were and there are uh, no, uh, uh, no forces uh, down, uh, down up but mainly these two drivers uh, uh, should be taken into consideration. Uh, in the mid of 2019, uh, Russian government uh, got a very important decision. Uh, actually, federal government approved the amendments to the law on uh, small and medium-sized businesses in Russian Federation. It means that now, by definition, social entrepreneurship in Russia is a particular kind of business. For us, it was very important because for many years, we used to talk that social entrepreneurship in Russia was kind of a semi-formal movement, uh, partly businesses, partly NGOs. But uh, now, uh, in accordance to these amendments, we have very strong position of the government that first of all, we should talk about small and medium-sized business, which can and should be supported by the government in different ways. Government actually proposed several pretty strong criteria, uh, mainly related to business model of social enterprise, uh, where actually uh, beneficiaries and social entrepreneurs are. Uh, beneficiaries, uh, for example, uh, workers uh, with particular conditions, they can be inside enterprise, they can be uh, to the end of uh, value chain as a customers, or they can be in the beginning of value chain, uh, and uh, social entrepreneurs uh, just uh, try to connect them uh, with market. These two very simple criteria actually uh, put into the law. And then government proposed uh, particular uh, rules. Uh, in accordance with these rules, every social enterprise uh, can uh, fill some forms, can fill some papers, and uh, try uh, to join a particular uh, list of social entrepreneurs. Julia will talk about it a little bit more precisely in uh, several minutes. Again, the first important point, the government continue to be the most important driver. What about big corporations? Now big corporations are trying to transform their charity activities to the support of social entrepreneurs because for them it's cheaper and much more effective, especially after these amendments were put into the real because now for businesses is just a cheap and rational choice 
not just to spend money for community, but to support social enterprises. And it's very easy and very visible. And actually, we were talking about it pretty clear in our chapter, and now it's reality. Then the second important point for us, uh, also in our chapter, we try to speculate with theory, uh, with the idea of uh, mission of social enterprise. Uh, we try to connect the idea of social mission with the uh, concept of creating shared value by Michael Porter. And our point was that social enterprise, at least in Russian Federation, uh, should create shared value. And again, uh, we were right, because in this case, we are talking about small businesses. We should not only, not only think about social value, but also about value for themselves, at least to survive. And maybe uh, one more point uh, about uh, typology of social enterprises. Up to now, on the one hand, in accordance to the law, we have individual entrepreneurs and commercial enterprises, which are, in according to these amendments, can be treated as social enterprises. On the other hand, up to now, we have particular groups of NGOs, which on the, un on the one hand, not connected to this law, but on the other hand, they still continue to play a very important role in the very field of social entrepreneurship. Julia, your five minutes, please. Uh, good evening, everybody, dear colleagues and friends. Nice to see you. And uh, just uh, to add on what uh, Yuri said, I would like to emphasize the fact that uh, that time when we developed our typology, we really uh, tried to analyze the situation of the development of the sphere uh, within the several years. And as Yuri said, uh, we see that uh, the development of this sphere is accordingly, uh, yeah, is um, developed accordingly, uh, right? So, but uh, we uh, use the term in the book, a semi-official way of the, of the development of this sphere. What does it mean? It means that everybody understood uh, that this is a new phenomenon in Russia, but it was not formally uh, accepted. Uh, and um, we see now that uh, this semi-official way of the development is still here because from one side we have this formal um, formal structure or legal structure uh, where social entrepreneurship is uh, um, is regulated. It's a, a part of the small and medium enterprises. But from another side, we understand that this phenomenon is wider and the nonprofit organizations with entrepreneurial activities are still not uh, legally formed or legally a sign, right? So in, in this sphere. So it, it means that still this semi-official uh, uh, way of development of social entrepreneurship in Russia uh, is, um, uh, is what we see. But uh, the government tries to, of course, uh, to um, offer different kinds of the support for at least for this formal part, for small and medium uh, social enterprises. Uh, and the, uh, uh, in order to get the support, uh, and it's, uh, I think, a good step forward because uh, we have different kinds of the support already, tax, uh, the support uh, with the education and different uh, other kinds. But anyway, in order to get this support, the social enterprise should uh, be registered at, uh, yeah, within a special uh, uh, register base, uh, registration base. So uh, it means that anyway, we can now see uh, and get the data. And this is what we are doing now, right? So we are collecting data on such kind of the enterprises which get support from the state. We analyze them from the perspective of their social goals, of the spheres, of the type of the um, 
business models they apply. And uh, what we see now also that the discussion around the second part of the typology, which is around non-profit organizations, is very active in Russia because everybody understands that the non-profit organizations are still in this semi-official sphere. And uh, we think that in the nearest future, uh, the nonprofit sector uh, also will, uh, or social enterprises, uh, social, social entrepreneurship in the nonprofit sector also will be formalized. Yeah, so this is uh, what we can say. And um, I think that, uh, as Yuri said, that the development of this sphere uh, very much reflects uh, the typology which we was developed for, for the uh, chapter uh, which we made for this book. Thank you very much. Uh, let me add just, uh, just one sentence uh, to add, uh, because, you know, uh, exactly for us, it's uh, very interesting to uh, continue to analyze this semi-formal status, because on the one hand, even now, uh, with these amendments to the law, uh, we uh, don't have particular legal status of social enterprise. It's a uh, kind of temporary status when this enterprise is in the list, because this list uh, actually uh, for one year or two years only at last, for two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, every two years, this enterprise should fill another form to demonstrate that this enterprise still follow this criteria strict. That's why it's just uh, not a status, but a chance to obtain additional support from the government mainly, and partly from the corporations, which are related to the government, if particular enterprises following these rules and this criteria. In any case, it's still semi formal Very interesting to analyze. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia and uh, Yuri, about this interesting insight, how things are changing and how things are developing in the social entrepreneurship sector in Russia. Uh, I will now ask Mark to give some comments to the presentation and maybe also some uh, XM context uh, on our social, social enterprises Central and Eastern European uh, book. Uh, and uh, we will have short discussion after. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see all of you because, you know, this XM adventure has been very intense. And so to see you all again is such a, a, a pleasure and I hope to see you, all of you in Frankfurt in, in, uh, in some months. Uh, I will be brief because I think it's important to open the floor to comments and questions. But uh, I would like to, to share a few, a few ideas which are developed in the final or, or, or the final chapter of the book. Um, we understood uh, that each region, each country has its own history, legacy, the type also of concepts which are used. Sometimes we speak about social enterprise, social businesses, social economy, cooperative. And that's very important to have a pluralistic view uh, of the field, which is embedded uh, in each context. However, I, I love the expression used by uh, Slobodan saying we took a little bit a meta position uh, in the XM project. The idea was not to impose uh, a definition, a strict definition of social enterprise, but to open the field, even, of course, that we had some common uh, conception of this kind of organization, which have to be entrepreneurial and driven by social aims. But this uh, approach is very wide and doesn't impose a very strict definition. So I'll share uh, two, three slides. Uh, just a moment. Okay. So do you see my screen? Mm, no, for now. Not yet. But maybe it's loading, yeah.
Yeah, there is still still nothing marked. There's not even Marta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she disappeared together with her PowerPoint. Maybe we can wait wait for a second to see if she coming back. I will just send her the message. You better try with WhatsApp or similar. Yeah, maybe maybe because I think she's having problems with the internet. Yeah, yeah. I, I I see that she's maybe not connected and not here. Maybe we can start uh with the discussion part and then Marta would have some concluding comments. So I will open open the floor now for the discussion and for questions. Anyone uh, of you who want to pose a question or comment something from the presentation it's open it's open to join and to ask questions please just you know turn turn in your mic and and uh speak um i i have a question Hi, for yeah. dr blagoff and dr ray um i um i'm i'm leo i'm um I, I study um, intermediate organizations in the innovation ecosystem. I'm originally from South Korea and I'm currently a doctoral student um, at Georgia Tech in the US. Um, I really um, I really enjoyed reading um, through the chapter on Russia and also the 2019 article in the Social Enterprise Journal. Um, and there were just some points that I, I, I just was more curious about because uh, um, so today you also mentioned that um, corporate philanthropies are um, are really important intermediaries in the social enterprise ecosystem in Russia, and um, and that in, in throughout the history they made a turn from social service providers to social entrepreneurship intermediaries. And um, I was wondering, like, you know, what led to this transition? I mean, was there like more high level dialogue um, between the government and um, and the philanthropies, or I mean, or were there other factors involved that um, that that has led to this transition? And then, um, and then, an, an additional question that's related is, um, in your book chapter, you mentioned about centers of innovation in the social spheres, and I mean, um, I was wondering how these actually work in reality, because uh, in the book you hint that they're actually really related, closely um, related to the corporate philanthropies, um, but it wasn't quite clear whether. Um, um, the corporate philanthropy programs work through the centers or if they're independent or if or if they're just more of a partnership. And so I just wanted to hear more about that. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for your great questions. The good news, there are two of us here and we're equipped enough for the both questions. You know, uh, concerning uh, corporate philanthropy, uh, you know, uh, mainly, mainly it wasn't a uh, high level decision about it. Uh, because historically, uh, in Russian Federation, uh, after Soviet Union, uh, mainly uh, big corporations uh, were and are still so-called responsible for territory or doing their business. And in many cases, when we are talking about heavy industry like metallurgy, oil and gas, uh, we are talking about huge regions uh, and uh, huge islands like uh, Sahalin Islands, uh, you know, this kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, there is a kind of uh, uh, social contract between government and corporations. The corporations uh, will uh, take care of this territory by themselves. It means that uh, companies are more or less free what kind of support to organize and how to manage this support. And uh, historically, we can uh, maybe talk about several stages. Uh, and the first typical stage, uh, mainly presented in the 90s after the crash of the Soviet Union, they just uh, continue to support this territory uh, through uh, infrastructure, which historically was owned by enterprises. Then uh, they continue uh, to use philanthropy uh, through uh, giving uh, in kind uh, and in money. Uh, but then step by step, uh, they try to find uh, 
solutions which were more uh, business in nature. It was and is not only social entrepreneurship, uh, different kinds of partners, partnerships. And even this uh, big and cynical idea that corporations are not responsible for NGOs, they can be responsible for social problems. It's not the same. Uh, but now uh, for companies, it's very clear they are ready to cooperate with NGOs only and if NGO can demonstrate uh, their competencies in working with particular social and environmental problems. Concerning social enterprises, uh, now we can say that these trend based on their own experiences. Actually, for the last approximately 20 years, uh, leaders of big Russian businesses, step by step, uh, they try to develop social entrepreneurship around their facilities. Uh, maybe the first wave uh, started many years ago uh, in 1990. 1999, uh, after this financial crisis, uh, when uh, economical situation was uh, pretty terrible, and they tried to organize kind of partnerships with local government, with uh, into, with uh, uh, into uh, small enterprises, uh, just uh, to uh, make a general social atmosphere in their places a little bit, but better. But now it's just very simple choice, very simple calculation. It's cheaper and more effective to support social enterprises in compare with charity. On the other hand, uh, programs of charity are still alive and they're still developing. Uh, now mainly the main trend is corporate volunteering, but only time and again, uh, also time and again, even corporate volunteering now for big corporations uh, means not only uh, to support uh, particular groups of people through social programs. They more and more trying to connect corporate volunteering with their own targets to develop skills of their workers, to develop values of their workers, just to develop their businesses. Time and again, from my standpoint, it's uh, creating, creating shared value time and again. That's why, just to summarize, uh, probably uh, it wasn't a particular pact or kind of maybe mutual agreement uh, between uh, government and corporations. Um, mostly it's their rational choice based on their own experience. And this experience is pretty long already, 10 years, somewhere 15 years, even more. Julia, the second question, your favorite one. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your great questions. I try to be short uh, about yeah. the centers uh, of social innovations, right? So which we mentioned in our chapter. Uh, this is the organizations which are initiated by the state and uh, but in some cases, in some regions, they are launched uh, in cooperation between state and large corporations. So in some regions where uh, the uh, and we have large enterprises, which are the main taxpayers in the regions. So this kind of the uh, centers are launched in collaboration between state and a large corporation because of course the large corporations have knowledge in the region they have resources and it makes sense right to uh, to establish uh, such uh, centers uh, through such types of the collaboration and of course uh, such um, in, uh, organizations become became uh, great boosters uh, in uh, in social entrepreneurship sphere uh, yeah and uh, they really enhance the development of ecosystem of social entrepreneurship there yeah so yeah. just well thank you thank you thank you for your answers I, I see that we can see now the Mars presentation, so we will continue with her comments and yes. uh, have, have some some couple of minutes for additional discussion afterwards. We are already around six o'clock, but I think that we can take 10 more minutes to have Mars input and a few additional comments and discussion regarding your presentation. So Mars, please. Thank you, and sorry for the connection, uh, which is bad, I don't know why, but I will be very short. I don't know when you didn't hear me anymore, but my main point was saying that, of course, uh, every region, every country 
has its own context and it's very important to understand the situation to see the specific context of each, each region. But at the same time, we took a little bit what uh, Slobodan uh, said about a meta position about uh, this field, saying uh, it's impossible to have a, a unique definition. Uh, let's have a very wide um, view on this field uh, regarding all these type of organization we are shaped by entrepreneurial dynamics and at the same time following social aims. But we know that in, in every country, there are diff the different definitions, legal forms, and even within, and that's very important, the same country, you could have different models. And so uh, we developed a, a triangle. You know that in social economy, we love triangle. Of course, uh, I won't explain all, all the, the logic behind this triangle, but the main idea was the following, based on two main uh, concepts. The first one about the kind of interest uh, pursued by the organization, which could be as capitalist uh, interest, general interest, or mutual interest. It means the, the interest of the members, but which is non-capitalist, and also the type of business model, uh, saying the articulation between market and non-market resources. It was to, uh, possible to explain the development of four main models in the field of social enterprise. Entrepreneurial nonprofit and NNP, public social enterprise, PSE, social co cooperative, SC, and social businesses. And so this was a, a kind of uh, theoretical typology of social enterprise model based on strong analytical uh, fundamentals. But of course, it was very important to test the validity of this international typology. And it's why that uh, we ask. So, okay, we ask uh, every uh, part of the XM project to collect uh, data regarding different types of social enterprise in their own context with a very um, wide uh, approach of social enterprise saying, okay, in your own context, could you collect organization data regarding organization which could be qualified as social enterprise and please collect data regarding three main uh, dimensions the type of mission, the type of economic model, and the type of governance. Because uh, within MS, we are convinced that governance models are very important to understand the different type of social enterprise model. Of course, the idea was not to count the number of social enterprise, and it doesn't make any sense as we don't know the broader of the field, but to try to collect data on different type of social enterprise in every context. You see uh, the number of countries which participate uh, to the survey and the number of social enterprises uh, we collect data for. After uh, we perform some kinds of factorial analysis uh, followed by a cluster analysis, and it was possible to, 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 to understand different clusters in different contexts and at international level. And the nice uh, novel regarding this uh, exercise, exercise, it was possible to make this exercise only for Eastern and, uh, Eastern and Central European country. And so this is uh, the, main, uh, the main results. You see that we have one, two, three, four, five uh, different clusters. And this cluster could be um, connected to the different analytical model. So the, the first column, which is the group one, are small and medium-sized so social businesses. So these are mainly very small organizations uh, driven by a social mission, uh, uh, relying mainly on uh, market resources. So this was an important cluster in this region. We have one uh, model, the second one, uh, one uh, second cluster, excuse me, which is very close to the social cooperative model, even we don't speak about social cooperative, these organizations do adopt many cooperative legal forms, uh, are relying mainly on market resources too, but the type of governance are very different from the previous one, from the social business model. And then, and that's very important, we have three clusters which are very close to the entrepreneurial nonprofit models. 
The first cluster, which is group three, are these non-profit parent launch work integration social enterprise. So even these wise are commercial companies that are launched by non-profit organization. And the main goal of this organization is to offer jobs for low qualified people. Then the group four are these local development entrepreneurial nonprofits, mainly nonprofit organizations, uh, which have also a mission of employment generation, but also the protection on environment. And you see that the type of market models are very different from the social business and the social, social cooperative models, as they do rely on hybrid uh, economic model. Of course, market is important, but not so important. You have also public grant and donation. And the last group, as this group five, health and social services, which gather mainly nonprofit organization and foundation. Foundation are very important. The, the place of market is quite low, less than one fourth of the, of the income. And you see that uh, the type of services are in the field of education, health, and social services. So what's interesting in this table is to see that this general typology at the international level is valid at the level of uh, Eastern and Central uh, European countries with seven or uh, five different groups, but which could be um, connected to three models, the social business model, social cooperative model, and entrepreneurial nonprofit model. So the main message uh, of this table is not to see to see that to say excuse me that social enterprises are the same everywhere but if you take a meta position it's possible to see similar pattern at the international level and that you do observe in every country almost in all country these different models social businesses social cooperative and entrepreneurial non-profit even of course if they are, they are shaped by the national and uh, regional context. So that's what, this is the main message of the one chapter of the book. Of course, it's very important to deepen the analysis at the level of every country to understand uh, which are the, the debate, uh, the legal issue, or the policy uh, issue. But uh, the good news is that, in fact, the type of models are coming from different parts of the economy, which are uh, which are similar from one country to the other. Thank you. Thank you, Mars, for, for insight how the patterns of social enterprises in Central and Eastern Europe correspond and how they are under the umbrella of typology, which is developed in the Ixen project. I want to open the discussion once again, so to give you opportunity to have few last comments or questions to the authors before we conclude this session. So the floor, floor is open, please just turn uh, your mics on and comment, ask the authors. Of course, if you want, you can put also your comments and and questions uh, in the chat. Maybe uh, till some of, some of you really think about. Do you have anything to comment or add? I can pose uh, one question to the to the three authors, just with a quick quick comment. So uh, Yuri and Yulia have highlighted in their presentation how things are changing in times recently. Of course, we all written our chapters of this book a few few years ago things have uh, changed significantly from then how do you see the future development of social enterprises in this region so maybe just one one or two remarks uh sloboda nana and uh, yuri and yulia uh well uh, let me start uh, just uh, very briefly uh, you know, uh, now uh, we think that uh, thanks to these amendments, uh, at least uh, social uh, entrepreneurs, uh, they understood their place uh, in the legal system and they understood what kind of support they can obtain. 
On the other hand, uh, exactly what uh, Yulia was talking about, now we are waiting for more detailed regulations which are related to uh, non-profit organizations. Because up to now, there were several regulations, different ones, which more or less talking about the same. But now some NPOs are a little bit confused how uh, their, in fact, social entrepreneurial activity connected or not connected to particular points of these amendments. That's why, first, the very movement will continue to develop. Second, uh, these uh, amendments uh, will continue to be uh, the most important legal framework and the thought and probably the last uh, trend for the future, uh, more attention to NPOs. I think that's all. Julia? Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Bodan, Anna, can you have something to add? A magic board to see what is yes, the future uh, development? What we can see is that uh, in the whole region and in Poland as well, um, the current social enterprises are facing turbulent times due to a multidimensional crisis and also due to some uh, fiscal problems, uh, especially in um municipalities so i think uh this uh um this factor i mean uh, mutual uh, uh, cooperation uh, between uh, uh, social enterprises and uh, municipalities uh, which is uh, very important for social enterprises development uh, is now uh, this this part of social enterprise development is now uh, a little bit, um, I would say, uh, challenging than uh, it was uh, a few years ago. But uh, but we will see what uh, the future will bring to us uh, within the next uh, uh, few, uh, few years. But I can see a multidimensional crisis which will affect uh, social enterprises. Thank you, Anna. And Slobodan? I must say I don't have a full insight into <laughs> what is going on with uh, Armenia and Greece. I can only uh, assume that in Armenia, where the economic situation is very difficult, uh, the things are not progressing too much. Also in Greece, that actually reached a certain level of development, I think that this is not the moment for uh, uh, making uh, institutional extensions to the level that will make such a big step forward towards sustainability stage. Yet, uh, I was recently doing a, a comparative survey on youth uh, policies and initiatives in the former Soviet Union countries, so-called Eastern Partnership countries. And from there, I could see that actually there are uh, many uh, volunteering and charity activities being uh, done by the youth in these countries. And also in Armenia, there are some, uh, uh, let's say, activities that show that, uh, on the other hand, when you can say that there are no incentives for institutionalization, there are always needs to conduct the, the, the social entrepreneurial activities. So it will not disappear because there is always a need for that. Of course, I know more about Serbia, and uh, there was a, a big important step made uh, a few years ago that the new law on social entrepreneurship has finally been uh, uh, enacted. So there were several years of working on this document. At some point, uh, civil society organizations uh, uh, actually fought to stop the development of the law because it was disastrous. So the propositions of the law were really uh, funny, at least to say. Now it looks much better. Uh, and uh, the council was established for the development of social enterprises and they are having sessions and working on uh, profiling the program for the next year. Uh, and I think that they're, they have some voices they have a they can send message to the ministry of finance which turns to be important in this stage mm. so i'm looking forward to see what is happening meanwhile the networking is at the same level i think there are few uh, uh big 
organizations that actually support social enterprises. And I don't know about the number. It is always difficult to assess the number of enterprises, but nothing changed significantly concerning the types of the enterprises. So it is a good thing that actually the new law recognizes uh, uh, associations of citizens or NGOs as one of the forms, because that, there was a big dispute on if the associations of citizens can make income or not, and so on. That's a good thing because 40% of our social enterprises are in the form of uh, associations of citizens. So I believe that, that we will have an interesting uh, two or three years coming mm -hmm. to deal with that. There were some researches done meanwhile on how the social enterprises operated during the COVID crisis. Uh, also, now that uh, we have a quite large influx of the of the uh, refugees uh, due to war, both from Russia and uh, and uh, Ukraine, maybe those coming from Russia uh, shouldn't be called uh, refugees because they just use passports to come here. But everyone knows what uh, is actually going on. Uh, so there is some support being provided in mm -hmm. that regard. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, yeah. Interesting times are coming. Yeah, definitely. Th thank you, Sobodan. And uh, I think that we, we, given the time with these thoughts about the future, can conclude our session. We may not know what we're, we, we may not be certain what will happen in the future, but for certain we know two things. First is that that we will continue to research and investigate this sector in Central and Eastern European countries. So the next opportunity to get more insights on that would probably be the MS conference to which we can encourage you all to, uh, to apply. And we will have, as Anna said, specific, probably will have a specific panel on uh, Central, Central and Eastern European countries. The next thing that we are certain is presented here. So we will, uh, MS will continue with the university book sessions. And next session is next month on the topic of social innovation on, uh, in Latin America. And uh, we can invite you to join this session, but also the session that uh, will follow uh, afterwards. There are also some exam sessions about social enterprises in Western Europe and another session which are contribu contributing towards exploring the variety of insights into social innovation, social enterprise, entrepreneurship and social economy sector so uh with the, with this few last informations i i'm uh, concluding this session and thanking you all for participating and hoping that we will all see each other in frankfurt but probably online sooner sooner than in uh, than in frankfurt so have a nice evening you all uh, thank you for a, for a great session and see you all soon